Welcome to this special edition of the Minor Consult. Last month, I had the privilege to sit down with Pulitzer Prize winning author, renowned researcher, and world-class physician, Siddhartha Mukherjee, in front of a live audience at Stanford. Our conversation included stories from his time as a Stanford undergrad, insights into his newest book, Song of the Cell, and a peek behind the curtain that revealed how he remains productive in everything he does. So without further ado, let's get into our episode. Sid, welcome. It's, it's delightful to see you, to be with you. And maybe you could talk, start out by talking about the Song of the Cell and what motivated you to, uh, to write the book and, and also about the progression of the first book, Improval Maladies on, uh, on Cancer, and then Genes and the Genomic Revolution, and now the Cell. Uh, so can you talk about that progression and about your most recent book in specific? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you for, um, for welcoming me. I came to this book after the genes um, for, for really two reasons. Um, the first reason was that um, it, it seems to be obvious to us, but actually it, uh, it requires a little bit of thinking through. But, um, uh, you know, the word life and the word gene have started melding together. Uh, the DNA, which is, of course, the source of, of uh, carrying the, the code of the genetic code, um, has become such an icon of life that if you see, every time you see the word life, you see a, a molecule of DNA. And that's appropriate, of course, because, as I said, it is the code of life. Um, I was in a, in a Botox clinic outside Brazil, not getting Botox, but walk, walking by, called the Life Clinic, and, of course, it had a piece of DNA in it. And I thought to myself, you know, what's interesting about DNA or, or, or this whole idea, this, like, this absolutely spectacularly beautiful molecule, so beautiful that when it was first um, modeled, um, a scientist came up to look at it in Cambridge, came down to look at it in the basement uh, where Watson and Crick were working and said, it's so beautiful that it's got to be right. Um, so anyway, so this has become such an icon um, that we've forgotten that, in fact, Without the cell, it's actually lifeless. It's a lifeless molecule. You can swallow it and it'll go right through your system. And it's a cell that brings it to life. Um, and in fact, if there was to be um, an icon of life, it should really be the cell. Yeah. Um, it was gypped. Uh, <laughs> the, the prize was stolen by this beautiful molecule. But anyway, um, and that's partly because if I asked you to draw a cell, you'd say to me, which cell, what cell? Uh, neuron, T cell, B cell, um, and they all look different from each other because they are so functionally diverse. Um, so I, I, I sometimes uh, make a very simple comparison. I say that you know, if you imagine life music being played out, hence the title of the book, or one reason for the title of the book, um, as a score, um, DNA is a score. A score is not music. Uh, it's not a song you need someone to play out that song. And so you need the cell uh, mm -hmm. to play out that song. Um, and just to bring that thought to its full conclusion, um, the, if you think about, um, for a long time, the physicists used to make fun of, fun, fun of us biologists and say, you know, we were the poorer second cousins or the third cousins, you know, the, 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 the folks who used to go get the coffee. Um, uh, but um, we've had our three grand unifying theories. We, as in biologists and by extension people who work in medicine, have had our three grand unifying theories since the 1950s. So evolution, evolution by natural selection, and neo-Darwinism and so forth. Uh, the second being uh, genetic theory, the fact that life is carried, the instructions of life is car carried by a code, in fact happens to be universal throughout the entire living kingdom. Um, and finally, cell theory. Now, the first two have gotten a lot of attention. You can fi find 10 million books on evolution, 10 million books on, on genes and genetics, including my own. But somehow, the cell, again, got gypped. Um, and, and of these three grand theories, the three pillars on which our, our whole understanding of life sits, our whole understanding of biology sits, the cell seems to be, the cell seems to have gotten the short end of the stick, so I wanted to correct that. Um, I'm saying this only half facetiously. I was 
genuinely interested in, in restoring back this, this, third, this third pillar, as it were. And the second reason is the excitement. Um, so the second reason is, you know, we're doing things with cells that we hadn't even imagined uh, being able to do five, ten years ago. We were just talking about, you know, the things that we're doing. We're transplanting pancreatic beta cells mm -hmm. made out of e ES cells um, into human beings so that they can make native insulin uh, without having to uh, stick a needle in their arms every few hours. We are making, uh, you know, we're flirting dangerously with the idea of making genetically alter, altered uh, uh, children. Um, but that dangerous flirtation comes from the fact that, you know, 50, 40 or 40 odd years ago, we began to be able to make children in a jar. Uh, um, I shouldn't say children in a jar, the first embryo in a jar, um, and then transfer that embryo into a human um, until that became a sentient human being. So, uh, so all of this was, was, was the motivation to start writing about this, this revolution that we're seeing happen in front of our own eyes. Sid, in, in all of your books, you weave together history and philosophy in addition to the current science and technology of the topic that you're covering. Why has that been important for you? And, and how does that enable you to really convey the type of message and story that you want to convey? Well, I think history and philosophy, history is particularly interesting, and I'll talk about philosophy in a second, but history is particularly interesting because it shows you process. Um, and it shows you, and we'll come to this in a second, it shows you how many times we've been wrong mm -hmm. and why we've been wrong, what the misconceptions are, what the misconceptions, um, and that humanizes the whole process of science. It allows people to understand that we're not, um, and, and medicine as well, uh, that we're not omniscient human beings who make up their mind in a binary way that there's a literature that precedes us and there's a literature that will uh, post-seed us um, and that we live in, 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 the, in the realms between these two. And it was very, very obvious during the pandemic when people would come up to scientists and say, you know, make up your mind. It's like as if someone was holding a gun to your head and saying, make up your mind, you know, is it A or B? And you'd say, no, it's actually neither A or B because I need facts and the facts will lead me to make a conclusion about A, and what will happen is that in 10 days, those facts will change. I'll have new information, as, as uh, John Maynard famously said, you know, when facts change, I change my mind, what do you do? Um, that doesn't mean that, that, we're, that, that we're pursuing rubbish, um, and that's the important distinction. It means that we're pursuing uh, a process, right. and it's very important to remind people that that process has been around not yesterday, not day before yesterday, but has been around for centuries. And that process has, has merit, has very important merit. And that if you disrespect the process, and if you throw the process around as if it was nothing, you make a terrible mistake. And those mistakes are, what, what people, are the mistakes that people have made in history. So, so I think history, you know, you may not care about you know, the first person who looked down a, a microscope and made a decision or made a conclusion about a cell, but I care very much because that person realized something. So you relive their excitement, but you also relive the process by which they arrived at a conclusion. Yeah. And then you, in my book, often you relive, relive the process by which they have to disabuse themselves of their own conclusions sometimes, or certainly of other people's conclusions. And I think that's very important to convey that this is, this is much more dynamic than you know, than checking off two boxes or one or two boxes on, on, a, on a multiple choice test. Maybe relaying those thoughts than the COVID and the checking the box and uh, how, how did we do during COVID in terms of <laughs> as scientists, as physicians in communicating the process and communicating the uncertainty associated with the process as well as the uncertainty associated with the SARS-CoV-2 virus and what it was gonna do um, as it uh, evolved. Um, and what can we learn moving forward? So I would say C minus, um, and um, for various reasons, we can go into the reasons that, you know, if you want to ask questions about that, um, but C minus. Um, and I think that we did that because uh, the first thing was in order to try to convey uh, a sense of authority, we confused authority with certainty. Um, and those are not the same thing. They're absolutely not the same thing. 
uh, authority means learning or, or convincing people that, that the process has authority, uh, that the way that we adjudicate evidence, that we know how to adjudicate evidence, and new evidence keeps coming in. And as the new evidence comes in, we have the capacity, and we as a community have the capacity to adjudicate that evidence. Um, uh, authority and certainty are very different. Certainty is when, when you are absolutely sure that you have to do something, and you know what the, and you understand also what the countervailing arguments are, and you understand what the, how the, the risks and benefits adjust themselves out, such that you get the, get, the, uh, get, the, get the solution. So I think we confused all of that and made a, 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 a tornado of confusion. Um, and of course, uh, you know, it's easy to bl point fingers and blame one person or another person. But I think the community did the disservice, and that was amplified by or, already seeming and sithering anti-science sentiment in the United States. But coming out, out of all of this and saying, oh, you know, it's the anti-science sentiment outside the United States that's responsible for the breakdown of communication only presents half the story. Right. Uh, the other half belongs to us. How do we do better moving forward? I think we convey exactly those things um, and, and, and reaffirm it in people the idea. And it's going to take a long time because you, know, you have to rebuild trust. Um, but reaffirm and reconfirm with, with all people um, that, that there are methods, that these are not corrupted and corruptible methods, um, what, I've, what I've been calling process, scientific process, um, and has been around for a long time, has worked for a long time, worked during COVID when it was appropriately applied, um, created new medicines. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's astonishing to me um, how much uh, bile has gone around um, vaccination. Um, remember, this is a, a vaccine that was made in such record time. The, uh, the last vaccine that was made, if I remember correctly, uh, in time, or, or the timing for the making of the last vaccine, was the vaccine against mumps. That took four years. Mm -hmm. um, this took six, eight, six to eight months to make a vaccine. So you can imagine the enormous benefits all around the world, not just around in the United States, but around the world, of, the, of, of science and its, its various um, uh, capacities. And then, having done all of that, having gained so much ground, we lost all that ground because, uh, because actually we don't know. We don't know how often, you know, how long that immunity lasts. We don't know whether, what, and, and we, are, we are now debating this. This debate is obviously an open society debate. Um, and admitting that we don't know is a good thing because then at least people th say to themselves, okay, these people don't know their recommendations are based on this much knowledge um, and I'll make a decision whether, whether, whether or not to do something or the other. So I think you know, we started off on a very, very strong footing and, and, and as they say, we, we, uh, you know, we, we, we pulled out defeat from the jaws of victory. Right, right. You, you're a writer, you're a scientist, you're a physician, um, and you weave all of those together, and, and an entrepreneur, you weave all of those together in your life on a daily, weekly, quarterly, yearly basis. How, can you talk about how each one contributes to the success of the other? And we have also a number of students here today that I know uh, look at your career just as I and so many people do is being inspiring and maybe you can relate back to your days at Stanford and did you have the vision uh, of who you are today when you were a student here and how did it come together? Oh, I had no vision. Um, <laughs> wasn't I was, wasn't as, as if I was sitting in the quad planning my, uh, <laughs> uh, my various careers. I was too busy trying to finish my math homework. <laughs> uh, which, by the way, I, I, can, I can tell you a fun story. Um, uh, almost everyone here is either in medical school or is in biology, et cetera, so you must have taken mathematics at, at some point of time. And, and you know the, 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 the two most important rules in mathematics, um, uh, which I 
tell my children, and they don't believe me still, but I still think are the two most important rules in, in mathematics, and maybe in biology, actually, and maybe in all science, is write big and have enough paper. <laughs> <laughs> How about so, an eraser? <laughs> yes, and an eraser, yes. <laughs> write big, have enough paper, and, and have an eraser, because, um, because the problem is that it's actually, it's actually interesting to you, too. The problem is that if you write small, first of all, you can't read what you've written. And secondly, you, you know, y your thoughts become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so um, there used to be, um, there used to be a, because Stanford had just recovered from the earthquake. So there used to be, and I don't know if they still are, because of, of course things change and then they don't change. There used to be a series of trailers um, along uh, Wilbur Drive. Um, and every evening, um, I would go and we would we organized our own study section between friends, uh, which was actually the only time I learned anything. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, and we would use the blackboard as our board to solve problems, because you can write big, you can erase, and you never run out of paper. Yeah. So, um, yeah. but but that's being facetious. Um, I mean. The way these feed into each other in a more more substantive way is that that it's not they're not coincidences. In other words, each of these has something to do with the other. Um, me being a physician, I, I write to think. Um, very very often, I will write something and realize something as I'm writing it. That that if that's true, then something else must be true, yeah. and if something else must be true, that must prompt a kind of experiment, uh, a kind of and it might be an experiment in looking through literature, looking through research, looking through history, looking through philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the entrepreneurship helps because it is the ultimate way. Uh, I don't think of, it, think of it as entrepreneurship. I think of it as it is the ultimate proof of bringing medicines alive. Um, because if, if there are many reasons uh, medicines don't get made ultimately and come out into the public. But the ultimate proof of, of a theory being right um, and, and, and being able to deal with the complexities, for me, as a physician scientist, other people have different mechanisms of, of proving themselves out. But for me, the ultimate proof is, is, that become, is, it, becoming a, is it becoming a medicine mm -hmm. um, and, and curing a disease, because that's, after all, what I care about as a physician scientist uh, the, the most. Um, so they all are related to each other. They inspire each other. They, it's the, you know, one inspires the writing, the writing inspires the uh, experimentation, the experimentation. There is sort of a dense web, as it were, that somehow seems to work for me. Um, it's not for everyone. Other people are, you know, there's a famous hedgehog and fox conundrum. Um, and um, I'm, I often describe myself as, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm really a hedgehog disguised as a, as a, as a fox. And if you don't know what the conundrum is, look it up. <laughs> what excites you today? Uh, the book's out. I'm sure you're already thinking about the next book or started. Uh, yeah, so so many things exci are exciting today. I think um, in the realm of science, obviously cell therapy. We were just talking about how cell therapy is exciting today. Um, bringing cell therapy to humans at low cost. Um, I think one of the proudest things I've done most recently is bring CAR-T therapies to India. Um, and I saw, I, there were tears in my eyes when I, I saw the first boy walk out uh, with relapsed uh, refractory ALL uh, cured. Mm -hmm. um, that was probably the, and he gave me, as he walked out, he gave me a drawing, which I have in, framed in my office, a drawing of an elephant. Um, and I now end my talks with that drawing because it's, it's probably the most precious thing that ever, anyone's ever given to me. Um, and this 10-year-old boy hopefully will now live like Emily Whitehead is applying to college. Sure. Um, uh, she was seven when she had her relapse refractory leukemia. And this boy left the hospital with uh, no disease. Um, so uh, CR. Um, so I'm excited about that. That requires um, a lot of engineering, actually, to bring those costs down. So I'm excited about the role of engineering, sitting in an engineering building, engineering medicine. Um, 
but I'm excited about all the new ideas that all of you would completely bamboozle us with <laughs> uh, that we never would have thought of before. And uh, while we, you know, learn more from the rest of you, basically, that's what's exciting. That's great. That's great. What um, we also live in an ecosystem, and you, you've been involved in your work in India, <clears throat> where there are marked disparities in health and healthcare, and disparities in how advances come to the benefit of those outside of sort of narrow regions that that have premier tertiary quaternary care. What are your thoughts about how to certainly what you're doing in India with CAR-T therapy, but more broadly, how we bring more advances in medicine to the developing world, and also, importantly, how do we address the social, behavioral, and environmental determinants uh, that underlie so much of, of human disease? Right, so, so let, let's, I mean, also let's be clear. I mean, the, 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 the idea of bringing car to India was, is, is a little bit like sending a rocket from India to the moon. It's not gonna solve the, the, the great social disparities that, that exist. Um, but I do think that sometimes people miss the mark on this. Um, I think that when you do send a rocket to the moon from a country like India or make car available, and, and you know, the biggest believer in this was, was Paul Farmer, um, uh, who unfortunately passed away. But the biggest believer in this was Paul Farmer because Paul argued that in creating the ecosystem that um, that uh, allows you to deliver T cell therapies in India, you have to basically create the ecosystem that then spreads out into a much, much broader network. Um, and it, it's, it's, um, there, there are ineffable ways that that ecosystem then flourishes. It flourishes through, for instance, um, ways in which you um, can address cancer prevention, uh, ways in which you can uh, address uh, early detection, um, behavioral change, social and uh, social behavioral change, and so forth. So I think that all of those are, are, are ultimately related. Um, and that occupying the tip of the ecosystem almost embarrasses the nation to thinking about why we are occupying the tip of that ecosystem um, and thereby sort of drips downward. And um, it's not trickle down, but it's, it's almost as if there's a sense of pride in creating the ecosystem, maintaining the ecosystem, like one maintains a garden. Um, and, then, uh, and then moving that ecosystem forward. So for instance, through the efforts on CAR-Ts um, in India, which are obviously the, 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 the very pencil tip of, of an ecosystem, um, the, the first question that, that I get asked in India is, you know, which, which we would never get the attention for, by the way, but because of that reason, the media becomes interested and says, well, what should we do in India uh, about cancer? Um, and the answer is not, is not make more car -tees. The answer is stop smoking. Sure. Um, and, um, and then all of a sudden, uh, you get a headline in India which says, you know, CAR-T expert says India's main job is to stop smoking. So you've now completed a kind of circle, um, and I think a virtuous circle, um, in which you've disseminated information from one very, very local part of the ecosystem to something much, much bigger, which actually I care about, uh, in the sense that, again, we're not gonna heal uh, the problems of the third world using, you know, genetically engineered T cells. Well, we're, we are going to cure uh, many, many problems of the third world and other parts of the world using behavioral modification, dietary modification, and other forms of, of change um, that, that are important. Before we open it up to questions, there are two questions I'd like to ask each, per each person I have the privilege of talking to um, about leadership. And the first is, what do you think are the most important qualities of a leader today? Um, well, I would say the, the um, probably just given what's 
what, what we've seen happen is, is the a capacity to admit defeat gracefully. Um, because if the, if, it seems to me that half the world is in crisis because about four or five people in the world don't know how to say that we've lost. Um, and so um, that seems to be a, a missing quality, gone missing in, in leaders. Um, uh, um, so that's, that's one. Um, the other one is, um, uh, which is uh, related but also unrelated, um, is, is the capacity to, to learn your own limitations and learn your learn where you end and where someone else's expertise begins. Um, and this is something, again, we talked a little bit about in the context of science. Uh, all scientists, not all scientists are great communicators. Um, let someone else help you who's done this before um, if you feel as if you can't do it yourself because ask for help when you need help um, because um, there are people who actually who know how to do this professionally and, and know how to, how to m make this possible. And what gives you hope for the future? Um, most people in this audience, I think. Um, uh, you know, yeah. I, I love coming back to Stanford because it makes me uh, very happy about sort of what's happening here as a university, but in general in, in universities. I mean, the, uh, obviously I got an absolutely spectacular education here, but, um, but there was much more to that more than that. Um, sort of, I learned how to negotiate the world. Um, and um, my only complaint back then, I think, for, for Stanford as a university was that it was too, uh, it was too much still um, uh, in its own head. Um, and I think that, I've seen that change very dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I think that's uh, one of the things that has been really remarkable to watch. Wonderful. Well, let's open it up for questions from the audience. Hi, I'm, I'm Denny Lund. I'm the chief medical officer here at the Children's Hospital and a pediatric surgeon by training. So you've got a busy life. You're writing books. You're an oncologist at Columbia. You've got a family. You've got two little girls. Talk about how you approach work-life balance with all of that. You know, it's very tough. Um, I sometimes say facetiously, I think it's overrated, uh, but I don't think it is. Um, I think uh, that's one area that COVID has shown, that, um, that if you disrupt um, normal work-life balance, you actually can be very, very disruptive to mental health. Um, I've written about it. It's in this book, actually. Um, and um, so, um, I think it's very tough. I think the only way to do this is really, um, what I, I take what I call mini sabbaticals of my own making from some part of my life. So um, right now, I'm taking sort of a mini sabbatical from seeing patients. I'm only seeing patients that, I'm, that I see in, on a continual basis, not taking new, any new ones. Um, I'm also taking a sort of a mini sabbatical from writing. Um, so usually at the end of when you big a, bring a big book out, people want excerpts and they want more. Uh, they want you to write more about it and they want you to, and I, I just told my publisher, you know, I don't have any words left uh, in my brain. Um, so I'm not gonna write, you know, three more op-ed pieces, pieces for the New York Times. Um, and so anyway, that, that, that's how my approach is, is to really sort of, it's, it's almost like medical triage. I see, I, I look after the sickest or, or the ones that are most urgently necessary now and take many sabbaticals from other parts of, of my life. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I'm Shoba, I'm an undergrad here studying computer science, very interested in using tech for healthcare delivery. Uh -huh. And um, also very interested in writing, um, actually leading, helping to co-lead one of the student publications on campus around uh -huh. biology and healthcare and innovation. Um, and I wanted to ask you, I loved what you said about writing to think and how you use writing as a means to think and come up with ideas. Um, and just wanted to ask more about like what your writing process looks like from like 
an idea to a book or an idea to an op-ed. Uh -huh. um, so um, um, I, I, I suspect that my writing process is a little bit uh, unique. Um, uh, I, well, let me t tell you several things about it that I've slowly started figuring out. Um, so when I'm in the middle of a book uh, or in the middle of a very large piece, let's say for The New Yorker, you know, that can easily stretch into, you know, writing a big major New Yorker piece could e is, is like writing a small book anyway. Um, there is a process that goes through my mind of being immersed in that book, um, especially if it's a book, but even a small op-ed, um, in which I actually think, and I've been really trying to visualize it, um, I have a, an internal conversation and I actually think that my brain, the two parts of my brain, the one that produces words, um, actually sounds out those words as if they were a sentence. Um, because you want your writing to have that conversational quality about it. Um, and I think there are parts of my brain that, are, that listen to it. And I, and I know this, or I think this, because I, when I write, I need absolute silence. Even like the small noises distract me. Um, and so, and I, and I think that that's a, the reason is that I'm trying to listen to my own voice in my head. Uh, so um, a different way of putting it would be that, that I'm, I'm listening to voices in my head is <laughs> called psychosis. But, um, uh, but there is a psychotic element to it um, in the sense that you are really in that moment or in that sphere. Um, and so my process is very much that I need a lot of isolation, um, and I, you know, I take a sabbatical. I, uh, uh, even at, you know, in the middle of the book, I often take a sabbatical from my lab, from my own lab. So I assign projects. I meet people only for an hour or an hour and a half during the day um, to make sure that the projects are alive and they haven't died. But then I go back into my room, shut the door, complete silence again, you know, retreat, and then, and, then, and then continue the writing. Wonderful. Let's have a round of applause to thank our guests. Thank you very much. And wonderful questions. Thank you very much. Thank and you, Lloyd. Thank you very much, Sid. Thank you for listening to The Minor Consult with me, Stanford School of Medicine Dean Lloyd Minor. I hope you enjoyed today's discussion with Song of the Cell author Siddhartha Mukherjee. Please send your questions by email to the Minor Consult at theminorconsult.com and check out our website, theminorconsult.com, for updates, episodes, and more. To get the latest episodes of the Minor Consult, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate the podcast five stars. Your feedback helps make this podcast happen. Thank you so much for joining me today. I look forward to our next episode. Until then, stay safe, stay well, and be kind.